Okay. Welcome, everybody. My name is Tommy Soares. I'm the Assistant Director of the Purdue Institute of Inflammation, Immunology, Infectious Disease. And today I have the honor of welcoming Jim Henderson, who's the Genetic Analysis Account Manager for Indiana at Thermo Fisher Scientific in Indianapolis. Welcome. Welcome, Jim. Thank you so much for coming to the show and coming to talk to us, letting us a little bit know about you and your journey. Oh, I'm happy to be here. Uh, this is, uh, this is a, a thrill to be able to talk to somebody who had his training in science and now is dedicated to the sales side of science. And the whole journey uh, is something that we are really interested in learning about. We, we want to hear a little bit about your background and what you're doing now, definitely. And uh, maybe we can, uh, we can ask a few uh, tidbits in between. Does that sound good to you? Yeah, that sounds great. Excellent. So why don't you tell us a little bit about your background and uh, what's, your, what's your training in and how you got into Thermo Fisher eventually? Okay. Yeah. So my story is a little bit long, so I apologize for that. But I got uh, my PhD at Purdue University in the biochemistry department through the School of Ag. Um, I was in Joe Ogus's lab. I worked with plants, loved it, um, had a great time, finished up and even did a postdoc at Purdue for a year. Um, and completely, I just walked across the street to a different lab, but completely switched fields and um, everything like that, even though it was a very small move, it was a very scientifically significant move um, and worked with Mark Hall in the biochemistry department for a year. And then I switched to teaching at Purdue to, um, Basically, I taught a uh, biochemistry lab to non-majors, and I truly loved it and enjoyed every minute of it, but unfortunately, I wasn't able to pay the bills with that, so I became a field application scientist. That was my first move into industry away from academia, and that was for a company called Millipore, and I had that position for about nine months. And then Millipore decided they weren't gonna have field application scientists anymore. So that was my introduction into sales, basically with a shotgun to my head. But the introduction, albeit rash and very difficult, I'm glad that I got it because it was a great experience. And I was with Millipore for several years. And then maybe about five years ago, moved to Thermo Fisher and have been the, basically the QPCR and Sanger sequencing salesperson for the state of Indiana. That is, uh, that's pretty good. I mean, that's, that's quite a responsibility for the whole state of Indiana. Um, it's for how many people are doing QPCR in the state, Jim? Uh, I would say just about um, any biology or biochemistry lab at least is doing some. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, so that's pretty exciting. Tell us a little bit about this shift. You talk about a scientific shift when you went from Dr. Ogus's lab to Dr. Hall's lab. What was that? What was the shift? And can you explain what that was all about? Um, when I was in Joe Ogus's lab, I would say that 90% of what I did was straight genetics. Um, and it was with Arabidopsis and um, that was the main focus, um, at least for my projects, I should say. Um, Dr. Hall or Mark Hall's lab was definitely, I would say, um, also genetically based my project, but there were, we, basically I wanted to join Mark Hall's lab for two reasons. One. I thought he was a great scientist and two, I wanted to learn mass spec. And he, he um, gave me, he, he, was, he was a great mentor for that. Um, the only thing, if I had to do it over, I wish I could have been a postdoc in Mark's lab for a few more years. Um, it was just getting fun, but then that teaching position I talked about opened up and that's what I really wanted to do. So I couldn't turn it down. Um, I just wish the teaching position would have opened up maybe a few years later. Absolutely, absolutely. And I, I can confirm 
everything you're saying because you know you and I uh, ended up doing our PhD at the same time in plant biology, and it's interesting to hear you uh, think about that transition from a genetic-based lab to maybe it sounds like a, a pinning in genetics, but more biochemistry based, right? And uh, yeah. maybe the analytical chemistry, what was it about mass spec that you liked about it, uh, the technique or what, what was it in particular? Do you remember? Yeah, I mean, basically I liked how strong of a tool it was um, and the ability to find protein complexes is what I was interested in. And that's what I did in Mark's lab. And I found that fascinating how strong of a tool mass spec was. And Purdue had great resources um, for mass spec and some very high tech instrumentation that was available to, to, to learn on and use. So- Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So it was a proteomics based approach. That exactly. Were, yeah, that's, that's really neat. And so Jim, so, I mean, that, that's definitely a very different mindset, a proteomics mindset than a genetic mindset, but could you, could you use one with the other? Was one helpful to help you progress and grow as a scientist for the other? Oh, yeah, definitely. I would say science in general, if you're good at problem solving, you're most likely going to be successful. As you know, there's a bit of luck involved. Um, unfortunately, that's just the way it is. But yeah, the, the ability to problem solve can help either way. Um, if you went from proteomics to genomics or genomics to proteomics, the fact that you know, you're not just getting data from an instrument and, and regurgitating it, but you're able to basically look at it, figure out what's going on, um, it, it, it's helpful in both ways. Absolutely, absolutely. And tell us something about this new technique that you were kind of learning. Was it difficult at the beginning, or did you were you so excited that you just didn't didn't really feel like it was too hard because you wanted to get your hands on it? Um, I'd say the thing with mass spec was I didn't know what I didn't know. So looking back on it, I was very clueless. Um, at the time, um, but um, Mark is a great mentor and very, very patient man and a great scientist. So um, he made it exciting and he didn't make me feel like an idiot, which was really a nice <laughs> um, way to learn it. So, you know, looking back, I was like, oh, wow, I, that was a really stupid question. But when I asked it at the time, it didn't feel like it. So right. it was a great learning experience. Well, that's really good. And what a compliment to Dr. Hall. I've always enjoyed uh, working with him. And I, I like that. I like that you speak nice about him, too, because I, I agree. Uh, he is a great mentor and he explains things in such a way that makes it easy to understand. Um, but Jim, let take me back to that time when you were doing your postdoc in his lab, you were learning a lot, new techniques, and now this opportunity to teach and set up a, wasn't it a lab course that you were teaching? Yeah, it was. Tell me a little bit about that. What was that all about? So uh, it basically came about because a woman who'd been teaching the course for, I don't even know how many years retired, so I wish she would have hung on for another year or two just so I could have had more experience. But I knew I always wanted to teach. That was my passion. It still is. Um, and I hope to, that's my retirement plan, in fact, is to teach at a small school at some point. Um, so, you know, I don't lose my mind is basically <laughs> um, the reason why. Um, but yeah, teaching has always been a passion. It probably comes from the fact that both my parents are teachers um, I've always enjoyed teaching and the, I like the automatic feedback you get in the classroom. You can tell if students get it or if they don't, or, right. you know, you can always figure out different ways to explain things for different people. So um, fortunately, when I was doing my grad work, Joe Ogus is great about having, I, I imagine he's still in this way. He had lots of undergraduates helping out in the lab. So that's really what helped me learn that I like to teach. So 
Okay, so having that exposure, that experience in the Ogus lab, that's when you realize, oh, and do you recall, like, was there a moment when you said, oh, this, I really like this. Do you recall, uh, recall a time? Yeah, I mean, there were, we had a high school student, um, this guy, I'm sure, um, I think he became a, a medical doctor. He was just a genius, even a, a, when he was a junior in um, um high school, he'd come into the lab and he was just great to work with. And just to see, you know, fortunately, I, at that point, since he was still in high school, I knew just a little bit more than him. <laughs> so, I mean, now I'm sure he'd blow me out of the water, but um, <laughs> it was fun to work with him and just watch him learn stuff and pick it up and just take something small and turn it into something big. So just a, a very smart kid. And we had a couple high school students. We've had lots of undergrads and I was really impressed. This is my shout out to Purdue with the level of students that would come in. They were all bright and very motivated. So when I was in college, I don't think I was that way. So I think I was too introverted and too, you know, and we didn't have the same opportunities that Purdue provided to really, you know, get your feet wet into research. That's very interesting you say that. Um, and it, it's, an, it's an interesting, uh, retrospect because it does form part of who you are today, right? It's uh, you were part of that kind of camaraderie. You were part of that atmosphere here with the people as well. Um, and you were able to be part of that fabric by teaching some of these brilliant kids, right? And yeah. helping them see the light. Jim, let me ask you a question. Have you told the people at Thermal how much you really like teaching? Oh, yeah. No, my, my manager is great about that. Um, I've talked about maybe getting back into becoming a field application scientist again in the down the road um, yeah. so that I can have that teaching component again. And he also, I mean, Thermo is such a great company. They, they let me go to engineer training so I can learn how to take apart and put back together the instruments I sell because I think that's an important yeah. component to understand what's going on and to maybe help we have great engineers. The, the team I have in Indiana is phenomenal. I could never replace them. But my hope is, is that maybe I could be like, oh, I think it's this. So when the engineer comes, they're prepared. So right, right. You can be a you can be that bridge, right, to explain a little bit better in their lingo. Hey, yeah. I think it's part C thirty nine with that di diode <laughs> or whatever, you know. Yeah, exactly. That's great. That component, that's really cool. That's, uh, so you are, you are continually growing, it sounds like, in this respect. T tell us a little bit about, uh, uh, okay, let's start, let's start from the, the transition now to Millipore. So tell us, can you put yourself back into that frame of mind? What was, what was going through your mind as you, you were teaching this lab course, stressed out that maybe you weren't making ends meet. At least this is what you were saying, that uh, I really love this and I'm passionate about this, but it's, uh, I have too much month at the end of the dollar yep. uh, and I need to figure out a way to compensate for that. So now you put your eyes out for a position in Millipore. Tell us about this transition from academia to Millipore. All right, the transition was rather abrupt. In fact, I graded papers in an airport on my way to my first meeting at Millipore. So the trans I, I highly recommend if you can take a week or two off between jobs, do it. That was not the way to transition. And I transitioned into the national sales meeting. So I met anyone and everyone within Millipore overnight. So I went from, you know, teaching a lab amongst students to meeting everyone in a major company. So in the span of 24 hours. So it was a little intense way to start, but I'm kind of looking back at it. It was a great way to start because I met everyone. So yeah. I know I was a deer in the headlights, but at least things made sense a little bit later on. And one of the greatest things someone said to me at that meeting, a guy by the name of Joe Kramer, who um, was a great sales mentor for me, he said, Jim, 
20% of what you hear today is going to be important. You're going to be good at your job when you figure out what that 20% is. And I was like, that is a great way to look at it instead of being like, oh, I got it. And I think he just saw that I was just like lost and he right. was just letting me know that I shouldn't have to worry about taking in everything from the fire hose. Just get the bit that's really important for my job. Yeah. And I, do you feel like you figured what that 20% is by now? I'm getting there. I mean, I don't think, I don't think the point was, is that you'll ever know exactly, but at least I know when, you know, certain topics are being talked about at sales meetings, some apply to me more than others. Cause you can't have the Jim Henderson sales meeting that just applies to just me. So, um, you know, we're a large company with lots of different divisions and, you know, not everything is going to apply directly to me, but definitely I, I've gotten better at, I wouldn't say tuning out, but, you know, not worrying about is probably a better word about some of the information that's presented to, to me. It, it gotcha. Gotcha. So you're filtering some of it and using some of it to, to help you move. Now, Okay, Millipore, then, so you, they flew you out for this interview? Where did you go? Um, I think it was in Orlando, actually. Okay. And it, so you, I don't, oh, go ahead. No, no, please go ahead. I was just going to say, I don't know if you've, uh, Orlando has a hotel within the airport, so I never even left the airport. It was, <laughs> that was my, my first experience with a, a large company. I was like, wow, this is different. So you flew in, talked to them for a little bit, and then they flew you right back out the same day? Oh, no, this was a meeting. I was there for like three days or so, so. Okay, okay, wow, wow, okay. And so it was a meeting that they scheduled with interviews? Tell us about that. Oh, no, meetings. I already had the, the position. So it is interesting. Okay. The way I got this job was... I talked about all the students that I loved being, uh, you know, teaching in the Ogus lab. Well, one of them, his name's Colin Mitchell. He went on to become a manager at Millipore. And I remember to this day, I was at my kid's soccer game and he would just called me to see how I was doing. And I was talking to him and he convinced me to applying for this field application job. So it's such a, be nice to everyone is all I can say, because I, at the time I liked him when he was an undergrad, you know, and thought he yeah. was great and stayed friends with him, but I never knew that that connection was going to end up helping me get into industry. Yeah, and what a what a way! So he made you aware of a position at Millipore, and that's why you applied. Yes, exactly. Oh, cool! And so then, did you send him your CV and stuff like that? Yes, he he helped prep me for the the interview. One thing I learned, like. When in academia, my CV was several pages long. No one in industry wants to read something that's several pages long, unfortunately. That it's all like, do you have what we need? And then a lot of it, a lot of the other part of an interview is is how will you fit into my team? Like just personality. Um, right. and I I I found that, you know, that was a, a big takeaway that he nicely walked me through that it's like hey I'm glad you have all these publications and everything but no one cares um, <laughs> you can summarize that you know on the side but what people want to know is is what what can you do right right but uh, that's so important for everybody here that is going to be watching this, Jim, to know those are uh, very important guidance guidelines for people to follow. Um, how many pages should your CV be if you're going to be applying to industry? What I did, because I still somewhat disagree with that. To, in my mind, if I was hiring someone, I'd want to know anything and everything I could get my hands on, but that's the scientist in me wanting yeah. data. Um, so I make, I have two CVs. I have my academic one, which is, I don't even know how many pages. And then I have a two pager that um, I use based on my initial conversations, you know, like with the hiring manager, like what would they want to see? Gotcha. Gotcha. And do you use like Google Scholar and give them a link in the two pager to your publications? Uh, I don't even uh, have the publications on there. I just basically say publications available on request or something. like uh, that. Okay. Okay. You just describe what do you put in the two pagers then? It's basically my skill set. 
is a big part of it. And then um, sort of my job history. So they can see, I mean, I'm, I don't know, maybe I'm not unique or maybe I am, but I've kind of been all over the map with, you know, from teaching to field application scientist to bench scientist to sales. So um, some people, I mean, it really depends on how you want to word it. Um, yeah. But I sort of word it as, you know, I'm able to adapt and look at it that way um, instead of, you know, being like, well, why is he jumping from one thing to the other? And it's yeah. not really a jump when, you know, I'm five years here, five years, that kind of thing. So, right, right. You are growing, you are uh, challenging yourself to grow and moving, moving, but in a, in a very nice direction. It's not like you're jumping around, as you said, too much, right? It's, yeah. it's these CVs when people are jumping around too much that raises flags, right? Tell us a little bit about that. What do you think? I mean, you're doing five year, five years. Is five years the right time? If you did want to move around to start looking or- If you, you have know. a story, it really doesn't matter how long it is. I have worked at some places for just a few months and I just was not a good fit. Mm -hmm. And I can tell that story quite easily. The company culture was not for me. It's not that the company culture was wrong, by any means, it just wasn't a fit for me. So I didn't try to force it. So, and I can easily tell that story if someone sees that on my CV, like, why were you here for this many months where everywhere else? And I just tell them straight up why I, you know, it's a story. So that's the main thing. My, the difference between my, my, my one CV that's really long isn't as much of a story as it is just a data collection. Um, mm -hmm. The smaller one needs to be a little bit more of a story. Yeah, like, this is who I am, and this is why I am who I am. Yes, don't put your picture on it though. No, <laughs> the older I get, yeah. No, <laughs> no, I have even seen some some people making recommendations of do not put your picture on your CV or do not put you know too much fancy stuff. But as you say, just tell the story of who you are, what you've done, what your experience is, and where are you going, uh, right? Like what you're yeah. prepared to do. And if you're um, applying to a, like a really large company, chances are your CV is going to be read through a scanner and it's going to pick up on keywords. So it's just like writing a grant. You're going to want to add those keywords on there. So your grant, or in this case, your CV gets selected to be yes. reviewed personally, you know? Definitely, definitely. That's great, great piece of advice. Now, okay, I want to go back. Not that it was like, um, uh, you know, uh, a good feeling, but I want to take you back to the time where Millipour said, no, nope, I'm sorry, Dr. Henderson, but we're not going to have field reps anymore. Um, how, how did you, like, how, how did he handle that? Um, so it's an interesting story. So I, I was about six months into the field application role and I flew out to California for training. When I got to the hotel, I had a note that said, you need to be on this call 8 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. So I'm like, okay, I wonder what this is about. So the call was about, hey, we're not having field application scientists anymore. <laughs> so um, that sort of didn't sink in right away because of the time change and everything. But then I had to experience three days of training for something that wasn't going to exist. So that was no. awkward. But I mean, it was a nice kick in the pants. And I just, I was like, okay, I'm going to do something else. Actually, my friend Colin Mitchell, who got me in there, he called me, made sure everything was okay. And he was like, don't view this as an end of you know, this is just a, a, a chapter change. We'll take care of you at Millipore. They did. A very incredibly nice woman became my sales manager. Her name's Mary Bratton. She was phenomenal. She taught me how, you know, she was very patient with me because I wasn't a salesperson. And it's always been a catch-22 for sales. They're like, yeah, we need people, but they need to have experience. And it's like, how can you get experience if you can't get a job? So in a way, looking back on it, it was really lucky because I got thrown into it without experience. So that part yeah. was, was very, at the time, I wouldn't consider it lucky, but now I do. 
And you had this mentor. Tell us about her. Tell, tell us what are some of the things that she taught you? I would say that as far as a manager goes, it was like working for my big sister. Like she, at the end of the day, took care of me and had my back. And that I will work as hard that I, as I need to for anyone that um, I know has my back. And I think that was her greatest asset was, um, I remember our weekly check-in calls. It would The first five minutes would be what she needed from me. And the rest of the call, she'd be like, what can I do for you, Jim? And that was just perfect. That was the best. She wasn't a micromanager at all. She, you know, she had to be a little bit of one early on because I didn't know what I was doing. Sure. But once she got me to a level, she was really, you know, you know what to do. This is what I need you to do this week. Um, just make sure it gets done. So it was a really nice, I got lucky again with having probably the best manager for me for my first several years in sales. And did you, I, I can't I can't imagine you would say no, but I how did having your PhD help you in this role where you were you were you one of the only PhDs that that had this type of role for sales? In sales, um, yeah, it's not as common for salespeople to have a PhD, lots of masters, lots of MBAs, so lots of, you know, great education level involved, but um, I'd say the thing that helped me the most with my PhD was the problem solving thing, so I've jumped from, even within sales, I've jumped from proteomics to genomics to just straight, like, antibodies, that kind of thing, so having a general understanding of everything has really helped. Um, a lot of times um, I find that customers will be more open with me and, and tell me more about their research because they know that I'm actually curious about it and want to hear more. So that part you of it- You can talk, sorry, don't mean to interrupt you, but you can talk shop with them, right? Yeah. And I actually, that's what I love about the job. So it's just what I loved about being a, you know, at Purdue. I loved- learning what other people were doing and how they were approaching a problem. So even this afternoon at IUPUI, this guy, I was helping him update some software, but he knows that I love Drosophila because that's what I did as an undergrad, basically at IU Bloomington. And I still love it. And um, he told me all about what, you know, some papers that were uh, in the pipeline and just how cool the research was. And, you know, I, I just felt lucky. I was like, I can get paid to, you know, hear about some really cool science. So that's awesome. And not only hear about it, but you must feel like you are helping it out, right? With the product lines, with the reagents, with whatever you're providing for them. You can't, you can't just see that as, ah, oh, this is just a sales relationship. This is like, I'm, I'm trying to contribute the best I can to make sure they're well resourced, right? Right, yeah, and I could never work for a company that I didn't respect their products. So um, that, I just couldn't do it. It wouldn't be a good fit. So what, I mean, on the QPCR side, basically I know it's Thermo Fisher, but it's ABI basically is who I am working for. And I, as a grad student, I thought they made great stuff and I still do. So, um, and they take good care of their customers. So I, 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 I like representing something I respect. So that's that's important um, because uh, again, like you might have you might have had this proposition to come and apply to Millipore or send us your CV. We're going to get you a position or whatever. But you have a choice, right? And having this choice of large corporations like this that can. Uh, go one way or another, or that can give you certain opportunities, certain openings, do you feel? So tell me a little bit, I'm a little bit confused about the transition from Millipore to Thermo Fisher. Uh, it took me back a little bit to that time. What happened in that transition? Oh, yeah. So I thought I was going to work for Millipore until I died. I was very happy there. Love my boss. But then we merged with a company, Sigma, and the culture changed and it just wasn't as good of a fit for me anymore. Not that it was bad by any means, just a little different. And um, 
So that's why I made the change. So even when you think you have everything set, I mean, stuff happens, unfortunately. Um, so I'm happy now. I cannot see anyone buying Thermo Fisher. <laughs> I don't think that's possible at this point. Um, so I think I'm pretty set and, you know, the ABI line of things is going to always be there. Um, so I'd be surprised if, you know, the culture changed again where I am now, but, um, hope, you know, you never know. So you got to yeah. keep your options open, but yeah, I would say company culture is a huge important thing when looking for a job to make sure you fit in with it. Cause I'm, I know some people that are still at Millipore Sigma and they love it. I mean, it just is a good fit for them. So it really just depends on, you know, who you are. Absolutely. And, and what, where you're comfortable, right? Where you're happiest, uh, what type of culture you're, you're happiest in. And I'm sure you're making some of this culture, Jim, right? Like you, you have a particular persona that you bring to the table when you're working and when you're interacting with your co-workers there and your colleagues, right? Oh yeah, um, that, they let me be who I am, which is, I guess, the most important thing. They don't yeah. try to pretend, oh, Jim is, you know, Mr. Slick Business, because if you look at me or talk to me for five minutes, you realize he's not. <laughs> That's not, <laughs> That's not who I could be. So I'm, um, I have gotten, I've talked about fishing to people and forgot to even bring up what I was supposed to talk to them about just because I'm, you know, that's where the conversation went and that's where I wanted to go. I'd rather have friends than customers, I guess. Uh, yeah. That's the yeah. way I view it. And it really seems to um, work out, which is good. That's great. That, that, that sounds all, also like a great formula for success because you're not intimidating when you come to them. You're not coming to sell them anything. You're just coming to see how things are going. Is there anything we could do? Um, but tell us, tell us a little bit about what are some of these qualities that either your mentors or that you have naturally that are part of your success in being good at what you're doing now? I would say, and I mean, I know this is even biblical to say, but treat people the way you want to be treated. I remember when I worked in a lab and if someone came in and was just, you know, didn't care about my time, just cared about saying what they needed to say, that I was probably never going to talk to them again. Um, and, you know, some of the salespeople I remember, like, Olympus microscope guys, they were awesome. They were fun to talk to. They knew their stuff. And I just was like, I want to be like you. I mean, I look forward to when you stop by, you're cool to talk to, right. you know? Um, and that's the kind of the way I present it too. That's the people that have an agenda. I, I think that works probably. It's just not me. So um, if you see me walk into your lab, I probably don't have an agenda other than I just want to see how you're doing. Yeah. <laughs> I like that. Um, and what about this piece of science? Because again, like it sounds to me that your approach is, I'm curious about what you're doing already. And I'd like to learn uh, already but what about what you're doing, not because I want to sell you stuff, but because I have a scientific uh, inquiry here. Yeah. And that's a great way to make a relationship that'll last forever. And that that's why, like, I talked for Sofla for a long time. The guy was doing some, so I never did. He was doing uh, respiration assays, which I didn't even know you could do with Drosophila. So he showed me the setup and everything. And a lot of it was homemade. And I was just, that's what I loved about science is making stuff. Yeah. So and in Bloomington, I made my own injection apparatus to, to inject uh, Drosophila larvae or eggs rather to, you know, transform them back in the day before CRISPR and all this fun stuff could right. be done. And it was, um, it was amazing just to make stuff out of, you know, I, I used like all sorts of crazy hardware stuff to make this and it was just fun. And he had used like a, well, um, a, a capillary tube and all sorts of stuff to make his own assay basically. And I was just impressed by it. Nice. Nice. Um, so you get to travel into people's labs and talk to them, ask them, 
what about you? What about your traits that you think make you approachable? Um, yes, treat others like you want to be treated, but there has to be certain characteristics about you. Are you particularly gregarious or do you um, do you come across as uh, curious? Uh, what, what do you think are some of these attributes that, that you think or things that you've also learned along the way that you're like, oh, I used to do that and now I don't do that anymore or I do this instead? Yeah, I think being able to read people's body language is very, very good. I don't know. I've worked with people where I'm like, dude, we need to get out of here. They don't want us here. And they just keep on talking. And I'm like, come on, we got to cut and run. This is, we're annoying them now. Yeah. Um, so that's a big thing. I'm introverted um, to begin with. So the sales side takes a side of my personality that I don't normally use. Um, but I think because of the introversion, I can really pick up on when someone else is uncomfortable because they do the same things I do um, a lot of times. So I know to just leave them alone. Let them, you know, just let, be like, hey, if you have any questions, here I go. Some people prefer to communicate over email and that's great. Right. So right. That's, that's really good. That, so you have to learn how to read people and read their body language. Facial expressions are important. Was it, has it been hard with the mask from COVID uh, to be able to read people? <laughs> you can usually still see a smile through a mask just with the eye. But yeah, no, I, that's a good point. A lot of, well, fortunately or unfortunately, a lot of the really heavy mask wearing, I wasn't going lab to lab anyway, because a lot of labs would have, you know, like only three people allowed in at a time. And I'm like, I'm not going to go in there, make somebody have to leave. Um, right. their research, because automatically they're going to hate me. And yep. no matter, you know, even if I'm giving away money at this point. So um, <laughs> I stayed away during that time, to be honest, and only set up appointments. I never just checked in. You know, I checked in through email in that way. Yeah. Yeah. That's so important, Jim. Again, a great piece of advice, because you know, you have to be respectful of people's time and respectful of the protocols that are that are running, right? And there was there was so many changes in how labs were populated, maximum people, and uh, so. Uh, but but also this this you know empathy that you have, or this uh, consideration for the people that you're coming to see is so important, I think, because um, you you need to have that um, in any, I think in almost in any field that you're doing, even if you're a scientist or not a scientist, and I need to have a lot of that in the job that I do, and I feel like what, what you're explaining to me are a lot of these qualities of, okay, wait a minute, we have something to sell here, but we need to take our time and make sure we do it on, on, a, on, on their time when, when they're exactly. ready to do it. Yeah. Um, tell me a little bit about what you miss from academia that you're not doing now. I used to read a lot more, like papers and stuff. I miss that tremendously. I can technically still do it, but if you're not forced to do something, you sometimes just let it slide. I do read a little bit, but not like I used to. I miss that a lot. Um, and I miss like having um, like the ability to go to like a seminar whenever, you know, I felt like it almost, it seemed like at Purdue, just to see how other people are doing science and that kind of thing. And so do you get any exposure to seminars at all? I can always sit, you know, no one's going to prevent me from going to anything. And, um, but for the most part, unfortunately, I don't go to the, it's the same thing with reading papers. It's like my time is probably better spent, you know, helping customers instead of just, you know, yeah, listening Doing to that. Them. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And speaking to them, right? I, I hear your, I mean, you have to talk to them. It, it sounds like. Oh, yeah, definitely. How how um, how frequently do you have to follow up 
with people? And is it only particular people that you follow up with more frequently than others because you know others will call you or how does that work? Yeah, I mean, it, it's really just sort of getting to know your customer. There are certain customers I have where I know if I'm not hearing from them, everything's fine. And there's others that if I'm not hearing from them, I better check in because, you know, something might be going on and they're not letting me know. So gotcha. Gotcha. And so this transition to industry, how, how, in terms of your salary and commissions for sales and so on, is that how it works? Or are you on a salary and then you get a bonus at the end of the year based on what you have sold? How, how does that, how does that shake out there? So I have a, a base salary and then I have, I can, based on I'm given a quota and as long and, and, and then also a couple of different things like, hey, make sure you're things that'll help me reach my quota anyway. So it kind of is a, a good thing in my mind. And, and if I meet those criteria as well, it can sort of increase the, the commission. So yeah, the commission's paid monthly um, on top of my salary. So it's sort of like you're keeping track of where you are throughout the year. So that's kind of how that works. And I'll say Thermo Fisher has been very generous for giving. They gave us, you know, they knew. So I, I was through, I sold a lot of COVID testing stuff. So my COVID experience is a lot different from other people. I worked harder than I ever have in my life during that time. Yeah. Um, and so they would give us just a bonus for, hey, we realize you're not working anything close to 40 hours a week anymore. It's probably double that. So they were very generous through that whole process. Oh, good. Good to hear. And I can only imagine uh, your level of work. Tell us a little bit, what, what was it like? What, what did you have to do and, and how, like, what, what uh, tell us your activity during that time. I will say that, so my, my takeaway from the whole COVID experience, one was the state of Indiana did an excellent job with their COVID response. And the way that it all started was Eli Lilly took the initial, um, they did the initial, a lot of people don't even know this. They did a lot of the initial COVID testing for the state. They did this on their own dollar, which is amazing to me um, because they had the capability to do it. So they took that on amongst themselves. And then when the state was ready to set up these independent testing labs, Eli Lilly slowly moved it to them. And that's why I think our testing response was much better than a lot of other states because Eli Lilly stepped up to the plate and did a great thing in my mind. Um, and then like I set up several university testing sites and Purdue did a phenomenal job. The vet school, I, I got to take my hat off to them. They not only were they were they created things that we hadn't created yet they did some of the first saliva testing um that was available in the country and purdue did this and becky wilkes is the name of the woman who was in charge of it and she's a genius as far as i'm concerned she you know the, i don't know she was not like that wasn't she she's a veterinarian for one thing and she figured all this stuff out on her own and just did a top-notch job getting Purdue up and going and doing well. And it was funny, some of this, we actually, she would give us data so that she was helping us develop our, you know, giving us feedback and stuff like that. So really Purdue did a great job too. And so did the other schools to the South, which I won't name. <laughs> Uh, no, and it's, again, great feedback. Great to hear that, uh, Jim. Uh, and it's also great to hear that in the state of Indiana, we did such a great job at uh, responding. I, I was so impressed by the vaccinations, by the testing. I was, I thought it was all very well uh, organized and I was also very impressed by what they put together at Purdue. Um, and, and I, yeah. The testing labs were all super great. I actually worked as a courier for a while. Like say one testing lab in Bloomington ran out of something that Purdue had. I would borrow from Purdue, give it to Bloomington and then return it. And just the, I was, I, I 
I mean, I've, I like Indiana. I've lived here my entire life, but I was very impressed with the response people had on a scientific level. It was just phenomenal. And even I borrowed stuff from Eli Lilly and from LabCorp. They, you know, and vice versa. And they, they all just worked together and did the right thing. And yeah. it was just nice. It was refreshing. Well, and, you know, you are a product, it's such a ubiquitous product line, right? That you touch so many different companies, so many different labs. You are a great uh, conduit for making those connections. So thank you, Jim, for all your great work and the work that Thermo Fisher did during the pandemic too. And it sounds like you were quite involved and were part of the solution as well. Yeah, and it, uh, the peop all the different labs made it easy. I have never, never thought in my wildest dreams how much these major corporations were willing to share in a time of need. And not, it wasn't even like, like, so say somebody ran out of something, I would email three different labs and all three would say yes. And I just went to the closest one to borrow. It was just amazing. So incredible. Incredible. That's so wonderful to hear. And again, it, it's good to hear from an insider's perspective, because I'm sure several people that are going to be listening to this program are going to be surprised that, whoa, uh, really? So many companies just out of their own goodwill, out of their own, right? Uh, and, and people like you that said, no, we have the resources here to put some solutions together and we're going to enact them. We're going to enable them. Yeah. That's and, yeah. I'm still surprised that Eli Lilly didn't get the sort of the recognition they deserve. They did all our testing for several months and yeah. a lot of places shut down because they didn't have that resource and they had to build it up and Indiana didn't shut down. Right. Um, right. And that's one of the reasons why. Yeah. Well, and now we, you know, there, there is a big push for wastewater testing too, to see what kind of variants and so on. Are you guys into, into those elements as well? Are you into those types of tests? Yeah, usually those are done on a digital PCR just because you need to dilute the sample so much because obviously wastewater is not your cleanest sample just by right. definition. Um, and yeah, I know that uh, Indiana Department of Health is already working on that and they have it going. Um, I think it's incredibly a great way to do it. I, I'm thinking that dorms will probably start doing that, I hope, yeah. um, just yeah. because um, I know when I went to college, there'd always be like a pop up of like meningitis, which just scared me. And if you could sort of knock that down before it happened, I mean, I know that that's a little bit off, but that would be great too. Absolutely. And if it can be monitored, which building is coming from and so on and so forth, I think that that's a great idea and, and something that we've been thinking about too. Um, it's just been hard and difficult sometimes to get uh, the team together, uh, but maybe you and I can talk about who we could put together to put some of these solutions uh, forward. Um, Jim, one I, I want to know a little bit also before we let you go, if, I, if it's okay with you, what are some of the, um, do you have to travel a lot? Is that exciting for you as well? What are some of the opportunities that you have now for growth in your position for as a, as a, a, in terms of you're an account manager for the state of Indiana, but you know, what, like, where do you, do you have an opportunity to grow from there? Oh yeah. I can always move up. I do, I do travel some, but I don't do overnight travel anymore. When I was a field application scientist, I covered several States and did have to travel quite a bit. And that's coming from an academic schedule where I was teaching. So I had a little bit more flexibility to sort of build my schedule around my kid's schedule. So um, that was a transition for my family. Um, when I first started being a field application scientist, um, my middle son told me he hated my job right before I got on an airplane. <laughs> so oh, no. um, 
I actually just sat and cried on that airplane. I'm probably scared the crap out of everybody around me. Like, what is going on with this guy? <laughs> but, yeah. Um, so actually, like when they, when I look back, it was a blessing that I just that wasn't at a point in my life where being a field application scientist made sense. I had two younger kids, but yeah. now I, I mean, it definitely could. So I, in fact, I have a. 21 year old and 19 year old and a 14 year old so they probably the less they see of me the better is <laughs> that you're not you're not kidding about that <laughs> yeah although my kids are great i got very lucky there so good. they still put good. up with and dad jokes so it's all good <laughs> any of them want to become a scientist um my oldest is almost finished up becoming a. uh, uh a uh, biomedical engineer. He's finishing up um, this year. My middle son, geologist, and then nice. my youngest son um, wants to go into computer science. So there's science in all of that still. So yeah, that's great. That's phenomenal. Um, and what about what about you? What what do you think have been the elements that have let you sustain and continue to succeed and move? I mean, you talk about these mentors, they made a big impact in your life, obviously. What are some of those elements that you've picked up that said that have told you, yeah, I'm I'm doing well, I'm I'm succeeding here. And probably in sales, you had to go through a lot of rejection to become a, a better salesman, no? Yeah, I would say. Yeah, I think the biggest thing I learned. So what Thermo Fisher did during the pandemic was they were like, okay, you're not going to have face-to-face -face meetings. So we're going to teach you. And they they taught us how to, you know, sell, you know, over email and that kind of thing. And one of the biggest lessons I took from that was, is don't make sales personal. You know, you can't, it's, it's gotta be, you know, if they don't want it and you've done what you need to do, move on. Um, otherwise you're just going to alienate them for the next thing. So um, that's sort of, the one takeaway that I'll freely admit I'm still working on it. I don't like being rejected. I don't like losing. Um, and that's just a competitiveness that I think will always be there, but learning to be able to let it go a little bit, I think is very helpful. It's such a great piece of advice. Eh? You got to build a little bit of that thick skin because you're going to get dumped on. <laughs> oh yeah. And I mean, some people will hate you no matter what you do. Like, they go out of their way to avoid you and all that. And that was actually one question that a lot of people asked me when I first made the transition. They were like, what do you think of salespeople? They wanted to, to know. And I brought up like the microscope salespeople that I love to work with, um, yeah. that kind of thing. So I was always friends with my sales. I liked them when they stopped by the lab. They were interesting folks. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and that's, that's again, a, a great great guidance for the people that are watching is that if this is a route that you want to take, remember that you still have to be a people's person, right? You gotta, yeah. you gotta be able to talk to them and uh, be, be approachable to, and not come, not come in an aggressive way. And remembering some of your Olympus uh, salespeople uh, that would come in. Any other piece of advice, Jim? And thank you again for taking time to tell us uh, about your journey and uh, let us peek a little bit into your life. Yeah, I guess my final piece of advice is if you're interested in going in, I mean, talk to the people that you know that are already there and just get you know, make sure that it's a good fit for you. And don't be, if it's not a good fit, I mean, you're not married to it. It's not like it's going to be your life, you know, find something else. So, I mean, life is a journey. Your job search should be too. So if you try something and you give it a nice shot and then you're just like, man, I am miserable doing this, you know, go do something else. This, having a science background lets you have critical thinking skills, which I view it as kind of like people that do gymnastics are good at any sport because they just have total body control. People that are good at critical thinking are good at any job in my mind because they can do anything. So 
that's great. I love that. You should have confidence and, and you should you should have that confidence to say, I can do it all, right? I can do any of it. Yep. Um and I I it's it's awesome to hear you uh, you know be it's so uplifting and positive. Also having been doing this for some time and moving you know, to the, through the different positions and the different companies, and you know, it, it's it's good to it's good to have this perspective from you because it you know a lot of people they don't realize they get stuck in a academic lab and they think okay well this is it for me, but there are other routes there are uh, there are other opportunities in industry. Um, if if somebody wanted to apply to Thermo Fisher, what's the best way? Or if somebody wanted to get in touch with you and be like, "Hey, I really like what you were talking about. How can how can I apply? Who should I talk to? So on and so forth. Are there opportunities? Oh, there are always opportunities. So um, I'm happy to guide anyone and everyone from Purdue or anywhere else. Um, to you know, at least getting your resume to the hiring manager, and maybe having an initial conversation with you to see if you know if you like the company culture or if you'd be a good fit. So yeah, I, I think it's a great culture here. So I highly recommend it. The CEO um, is anytime I hear him talk, I'm always inspired, and I got to say that's a very nice thing to know that I've got that guy on my side. That's great, and if people wanted to get in touch with you, can they do so by LinkedIn? Yeah, I'm happy to um, always answer back. Um, it takes me, a, uh, it's usually not quite as fast as email. So I do my best. It might be a day or two. So I'll do my best. Great. Well, thank you so much, Jim. It was such a pleasure talking to you, Dr. Jim Henderson, the genetic analysis account manager for the state of Indiana at Thermal Fisher Scientific in beautiful Indianapolis, Indiana. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Thanks, Tommy. Have a great day, and hopefully we can catch you again soon, and you can tell us a little bit more. Yep. Have a good one, sir. Thank you. You too. Bye-bye. Goodbye.